a brief introduction i will give you a brief introduction about what the system which i am studying that means what xa binaries are and what kind of jets we observe from them then i will uh, jump to the small level of theories that are defining this uh, field and how our observations help in defining those theories and what difference our studies make in the case of those theories then i will give you certain examples of certain systems and then finally i will wrap up my talk with a summary so x binaries are sub so, so can you please change the slides a third one third one the next one. oh yeah thank you very much so x binaries are a special class of binary stars where uh, a normal star which could be i will call it normal star uh, define the uh, definitions further so that star could be uh, one solar mass or ten solar masses and depending on that we can differentiate our x binaries so here i am just saying that a normal star is revolving around a compact object that could be a black hole or a neutron star and the compact object is pulling matter from the normal star and for this study we are just concentrating on the black holes and the normal star is a, a near uh, you can say roughly one solar mass black hole so i will uh, i will say that they, these are low mass black hole exabundaries where the matter is pulled from the normal star onto the black hole through roshiro overflow and when you look at uh, the schematic you can see that normal star is generally bright and uh, optical uv but the majority of uh, the emission from the system is in x rays where uh, this disk is dominant in x rays but the outer part of this is bright in optical and sometimes in uv also and the apart from that we also detect these uh, jets which dominate in radio now these systems generally spend most of their time in a uh, quiet sense where the emission from these systems is really really faint but these systems generally uh, sometimes they show some episodic uh, enhanced accretion episode which is termed as outburst and the duration of this outburst is from few weeks to say in some cases few years and as these systems evolve on human observer time scales now these systems are best suited to give some of the fundamental questions like how these uh, radio jets uh, they launched and how the accretion and ejection they are coupled and the best way to answer these questions using these systems is the multivalent studies uh, can you please go to the next slide so these systems uh, they showed two different type of radio jets over the course of their outburst first is the compact jets which are observed in an outburst uh, in the starting and end so these jets they are self absorbed having a uh, flat spectrum and when you look at look at these jets in high resolution spectroscopy you will see them as continuous threads and they are relatively faint but when the system changes from uh, to means approaches the peak of the outburst where it is changing from i will use some jargons but i will explain it later on what that mean so when it is changing from the hard to the soft state so when i mean in the state then that state is uh, normally defined by uh, how many photons are coming from the disk and how many photons are coming from uh, you can say the non thermal photons are coming so when i'm saying a hard state it means uh, at that time the emission is dominated by the non thermal photons but when i'm saying the soft photon it means the emission is dominated by the mostly the uh, emission from the disk so when the source is transiting towards uh, the soft state which is close to the peak of the outburst we observe these transient jets which are discrete plasma blobs and they show a steep spectrum sometimes we observe a turnover also and these uh, transient jets they Uh, move at a relatively stable velocities now when we look at uh, the how why we are observe, observing these two, two type of jets the main or you can say the best explanation is uh, is that when we are having the compact jets uh, can you please change this slide when we have the compact jets there is a continuous uh, plasma which is flowing and when uh, 
the accretion rate increases, there is a collision between the soft moving plasma and the fast moving plasma. And during that collision, a shock is generated and then we observe these uh, transient jets. And uh, regarding these jets, there is one more very special theory, which is the Vandal model. Can you please go to the next slide? Yeah, so Wunderland suggested that when we talk about these jets, these are plasma blobs, which are adiabatically expanded. And the expansion in these uh, plasma blobs is generally a linear in time. And as you move away from, it, it means uh, when you look at the core and the plasma, uh, plasma blob is going away from the core and it is evolving. So as far it is moving and it becomes uh, observable to the lower frequencies, you will not observe that many variations in lower frequencies because those variations become smooth enough, which you can see in the right hand side image. That is like uh, the graph number six. You can see that there is very less variation in the relative flux test. And why I discuss this model, I will explain in a couple of uh, slides that uh, we observe that there is our limitations to this model when we talk about these uh, excellent ways. Can okay, please go to the next slide? Yeah, so the first and the most important thing came in everyone's mind that why radio observations are important to these systems. So when we talk about the radio observations, the first and the most important thing that came to the mind is uh, the distance. So using these radio observations, we can calculate the distance of a statistical object. In some cases, the best way is obviously the pallax, but in some cases, the pallax measurements are not possible. In those cases, we can use uh, the Doppler shifted H1 absorption line. I will show you the examples in my coming slides. How we use the Doppler shifted H1 absorption line to constrain the distance to a black galaxy objects. The second thing that we can uh, that we can have is the correlation study. It means if we observe the system in X-ray and radio both, then we can have an idea how uh, the efficient injection is covered. Further, uh, we can have we can constrain the various physical parameters of the jet using these radio observations, like what is the morphology of the jet. What is the opening angle? What is the Lorentz factor? What is the magnetic field of the jet? Or what is the minimum energy? Now, the so further in my talk, I divided my talk into three parts: part one, part two, part three. Means when I'm talking about the part, one. can you please go to the, the next slide? So in part one, I am mostly focusing on uh, the. Oh, sorry, sorry, I missed this one. So for this talk, I focus more uh, mainly on the S. Uh, two SK precursors, motion wide field array and the SK. But for one of my projects, I also use not one, a couple of my projects, I used uh, MIAGAR also. And for broadband coverage, I focused on other Australian telescopes, including ATCA, LBA, at most. In some cases, I also used data from DLP. Uh, so as I was talking about, I, I break my talk into three different parts. So in first part, I will talk about how we use the actual absorption line to constrain the distance to uh, extra boundary and how our distance help in understanding the behavior of that uh, extra boundary. Can you please go to the next slide? Uh, for the yeah, so when we talk about the neutral hydrogen in normal conditions, the neutral hydrogen having uh, the arrangement of the spin of the nucleus in the uh, electron is anti -tallow. But whenever there is any excitation, it becomes parallel, and that excitation level is quantized. And the photon corresponding to that particular uh, excitation is about 21 centimeter long. Can you please go to the next slide? So, as there is uh, any exoplanets are distributed in our galaxy, and then the region between between us and those exoplanets is filled with a neutral hydrogen. So, whenever any uh, Synchrotron emission passes through those intervening mediums. We have the imprints of those absorption from the uh, neutral hydrogen. And when we study uh, the spectrum corresponding to that absorption, what we can see is uh, the methodology. I will explain in the next slide how we are using that imprint to calculate the distance. Can you please go to the next slide? Yeah. So generally, we calculate the distance from the sun. So if you look at uh, the line of sight from sun to the, that, that particular uh, source, then there are various clouds which are in between us and the source. And those clouds are rotating around the center of our galaxy with a constant velocity. And the distance where 
our source is will be defined by uh, the radial velocity. It means if the source is too far, if the source is at a tangent point, tangent point means where the radial velocity is maximum, or if the source is somewhere in between tangent point and the, between us. So by calculating the radial velocity of that particular uh, absorption line, we can have an idea what could be the distance of that accelerator. Can you please go to the next one? So uh, the next, the first source that we have targeted is Maxia 1535 minus 1. This source went into August in September 2017. It's a black hole candidate. And many, many there are a couple of parameters of the source which are still unknown, like the mass. And at the peak of the outburst, the source is having a radio flux density of 5 p milli Why I trace out this point, I will uh, explain you in a couple of uh, slides. So this is an, uh, you can say the image is for, from ADCO observations. And you can see at the middle of the image, you can see the source is highlighted in a red circle. Uh, in the same image, we have also highlighted in a square an extragalactic source. Why I highlighted this, I will explain in a couple of slides. So yes, we detected this particular source with ADCA. Now, as the source was bright enough, so it's, we studied the spectrum corresponding to this particular source. And what we detect, can you please go to the next slide? Yeah, can you, what we observed that we have observed the actual absorption corresponding to the source. So the absorption spectra for this particular source is highlighted in red. And you can see some uh, horizontal dotted lines. Those shows the three sigma RMS noise level. So what we have detected that uh, at around minus 69 kilometer per second, we detect the maximum uh, velocity that are observed in the direction of the source. But when we look at that extragalactic source, what we have detected that uh, the maximum velocity detected in the direction of the extragalactic source is somewhere around minus 89 kilometer per second. Now, we solved the rotation curves for the galaxy for that particular uh, area and deck. And what we found, can you please go to the next slide? Uh, what we found that you can see this curve on the left hand side. And there is one, uh, you can say, peculiar thing, or you can say the legitimacy of this method that for every radial velocity, we detect two distances. One is uh, near distant, the other one is the far distance. Now, it is very important to uh, break this degeneracy. And in breaking this degeneracy, uh, this extragalactic source helps us a lot. So in, a, in, the, in the case of that extragalactic source, what we have detected is uh, in the direction of the extragalactic source, as extragalactic source are really, really far. And for that particular source, we are detecting, or we are observing all sorts of HN absorption. So the maximum velocity that we have detected in the direction of the extragalactic source is the tangent point velocity that I have mentioned is minus 89. And here you can see that it is something around 90-ish. So this, and that tangent well velocity and any velocity close to that, we are not detected in our case, in the case of our axiom. So this suggested us that our source is sitting at the near point distance of around 4.1 kiloparsec. Uh, we also further put a uh, robust upper limit of the tangent point, but uh, that is just for the sake like, but because it's very unlikely that the column between the tangent point and us is empty. It means there is no H1 uh, gas between us and the tangent point. And if when we put our source in the cartoon diagram of our galaxy, we observe that our source is sitting somewhere in the scutum center of arm. And that is further, uh, you can say, strengthened by uh, the detection of high NH in the direction of the source. Now, using these distance constraints, what we have found in the case of the source, uh, can you please put it on the can you, uh, yeah. So the implication of these distance constraints is that what we have detected that at the peak of the outburst, the axial luminosity is some something more than seventy eight percent of it. And when we, uh, we look at uh, this distribution of the sources with the uh, luminosity, what we have found that this belongs to a very small class of uh, axiomas. Now these sources, when they uh, you can say move from 
over the course of their outburst, they change various X-ray spectral states. As I mentioned earlier, those states are nothing but defined by the ratio or the amount of hard or soft uh, photons that you observe. Now, when the source is transient from soft to hard state, that happened at a very peculiar velocity of around 0.3%. But in case of this source, what we detect that it is thousand times lower than what we detect in a canonical blackboard. So this is generally an outlier. Uh, so this, this is uh, something very interesting about these distance constraints. It means if we don't have the distance constraint, we cannot have any idea about the behavior of the source. Now further, uh, our distance constraints are used by other studies to uh, calculate various physical parameters of the jet. Uh, can you change slide? Yeah, uh, next one. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, so it is used by other studies to calculate. So if you see in the uh, left hand side, it is an ad image of max J1535. You can see that initially there is no blob, and in the middle image, you can see a blob, and in the third image, you can see a blob is just move away out of the main source that is a transient jet we have been talking about so using our distance constraint Russell at all they constrain the speed of uh, this plasma block and they also calculate uh, what uh, is the distance the most probable uh, you can say magnetic field that they can detect for this particular uh, emission now the second source that we have targeted is uh, 1348. I will quickly skip it, skip it because uh, the main point that I would like to uh, emphasize is how the distance constraints uh, help us in tackling the behavior of these two uh, exomers. Can you please go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is uh, a mere image for 1348. Uh, this was went into August in uh, January 2019. This is again a black, uh, black hole candidate. And its mass is estimated to be something around nine solar masses. So our observation further helped in uh, constraining the, the, not constraining, but defining that what could be the probable mass. And for this particular source also at around 1.28 gigahertz, we detect a uh, maximum radio flux density of around uh, 520 millijoules. So in case of uh, max 1535, we detect the flux density of around 580. And in this case, we are detecting a flux density of around 520 millijoules. So we uh, monitor this source with ASCAP, and also we monitor this source with a MIACAP. But uh, can you please go to the next slide? Yeah, so you can see that this source is also detected with uh, high significance. And for this particular uh, case, we, instead of taking one particular uh, extragalactic source, we targeted a couple of extragalactic sources, and then we uh, created a combined spectrum for those extragalactic sources so that we have more robust uh, constraints for the extragalactic sources. Can please go to the next slide? Yeah, for this source also we detect, uh, it is, uh, so I will skip these things quickly because we are already short of time and because there are further more things interesting in further in my uh, presentation. So for this source also we detect a maximum uh, radial velocity of around minus 31 kilometer per second, but for extra gravity sources, this is something around minus 50. And when we solved our rotation curves, can you please go to the next slide? Uh, yeah. So there is one important thing that I was telling you that in case of uh, Meerkat, when we Meerkat observed this source, uh, it was in low resolution. It means uh, what it is around, I think 40 kilometer per second is the resolution of Meerkat. So to match it with Meerkat, what we did, uh, we bin our ASCAP spectrum. And what we found that the two spectrum are matching within the error box. There is small discrepancy that could be because uh, the, the, so Meerkat observed the source on 10th, uh, 10th of January, 10th of February, sorry. And ASCAP observed the source on 12th of uh, February. So that could be one of the possibility or the other possibility could be some uh, instrumentation issues. But within the error box, they both are similar. This gives us confidence that what we are observing, what we are detecting is consistent. Now, when we go to the next slide, you can see that the rotation curves further suggested that, yes, at the tangent point, the velocity 
is around minus 50 that we are detected in case of our axial galactic sources. And the velocity that we are detected in case of our source, we got a distance of around 2.2 uh, kiloparsec. And when we put it on the cartoon diagram, what we have seen that it is the source is situated in front of the sputum center of whereas 1535 was somewhere within the sputum center of And when we use these distance constraints to understand the physical properties of uh, the system, what we found, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so the peak luminosity is around 70 plus minus 10 percent, which is canonical. You can see the this particular system belongs to the canonical levels. Although, what at the peak we detect uh, a radio flux density nearly five, uh, 520, which is something comparable to what we have detected in case of 1535. But just because of the help of these distance constraints, we managed to segregate that. Uh, this particular Maxia 1348 is belonging to a canonical, belonging to the main canonical class of black holes, whereas 1535 is a belonging to, you can say, a more peculiar class of uh, black holes. And using these distance constraints, uh, as I talked to you, that one of the studies suggested that the mass of this particular uh, black hole is around nine solar masses. Now, using our distance constraint, what we have observed, can you please go to the next slide? Yeah. So using our distance constraint, what we have observed that the mass is something around four solar masses, which is more optimal for a canonical black. So this suggested that these distance constraints, which we have managed to calculate using our radio observations or using the uh, Doppler shifted H1 absorption lines are highly important to constrain the various physical parameters of these systems. Now, we further targeted, uh, can you please go to the next slide? Uh, we further targeted uh, the case of a transient check. So this, in case of 1535, as I mentioned earlier, when we are talking about the H1 absorption distance corresponding for this particular source, the source was also targeted with MWA. And MWA was going undergoing reconfiguration. It, means, uh, it was undergoing from is at that time they are increasing the uh, baseline for this particular source. So uh, the data was really tricky. We need to uh, flag the tiles manually to get the maximum amount of data. And in broadband, we also targeted this source with various other Australian telescopes, for example, Atmos, Atka, and LB. And what we have detected, uh, can you please go to the next slide? Uh, so this is the light curve for that whole of the outburst. So you can see that there is a sharp rise, and then you can see that there is a slow delay, a decay uh, in that, that particular transient. And we detected two peaks uh, in case of ATCA. But when we look into the, uh, in, in SCAP, we detected those two peaks. But in case of SCAP, what we have observed was just one uh, plasma block that was moving away from the main source. Uh, now, these two peaks could be that uh, we missed the other ejection event, or it could be that uh, the plasma block becomes bright and then it hits uh, some of the ambient uh, environment of the source. Uh, in case, at one particular moment, sorry, uh, which is highlighted, can you see my cursor? So at this particular instance, the source was simultaneously observed in broadband uh, using ATCA, utmost MWA. So what we look, what we try to do is we looked at the spectrum, broadband spectrum for this particular source. Uh, can this go to the next slide? And in that spectrum, you can see uh, ATCA observations, ASCAP, utmost, and then you see the MW observations. So here I will also point out one important thing that this is a first MWA detection of any XA binary and first detection of MW for any transient jet. So you can see that if MW observations, if there are no MW observations, uh, you can't detect this term. And as this is a transient uh, jet, which is confirmed with uh, already confirmed with ADCA. So the 
stun over could be because of two possibilities. One is free free absorption, the other one could be simple on the proportion. And you can see that we try to see the possibility of both the process. And what we found is that uh, in low frequency, synchrotron self-absorption model is fitting uh, the data well as compared to the free free absorption. Apart from that, we also look at the physical possibility of free free absorption, but in the direction of so we have not found any uh, actual reason. So uh, during using that, we figured out that the possibility of a free free absorption is very it is not uh, it, it's not feasible. And uh, we detected turnover at around uh, 320 megahertz. And using this turnover, what we we calculate the various physical parameters. Can this go to next slide? So uh, what we found is we calculate the. So we try to figure out what the Lorentz factor is, and we calculate the Lorentz factor at two uh, cases of the velocity where we uh, believe that the plasma blob is expanding with velocity c, and in other case it is expanding with a sound velocity, which is equivalent to one upon root three. And in both the cases, what we have detected is uh, the Lorentz factor is more than ten, which is really really high for a freely expanding plasma blob. Uh, this suggested that the plasma block is externally confined, uh, probably because of the environment. And that is again highlighted, or you can have an idea that as a, as a distance illustrated, that it is somewhere sitting in the spirit center of the sun, which is very dense and normal. So th that, that is again consistent with what we are finding in case of the Lorentz factor. Now we further look at uh, the magnetic field. Can you please go to the next slide? Yeah. So using the uh, mirror magnetic condition, what you found the magnetic field is around 40 plus 40 milligauss. And we further saw synchrotron theory. And in that case, we found it's around 100. But the error bar is pretty big. And that error bar is big because uh, there is huge error bar on the calculation when there was an ejection event. So if uh, you go into the theory of this one, the, the time when the ejection event happened, that is to the power five. So any error in the calculation of that ejection event will be translated into the calculation of this uh, magnetic field. And that is why you are observing those uh, big errors. So this further suggested that if we want to narrow down, if we want to constrain these parameters more precisely, we need uh, high cadence monitoring using uh, instruments like VLBA, LBA, or BLA. So, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so our, you can say, the targeted strategy for the transient just suggested that Australian telescopes are good enough to study these uh, jets and considering the physical parameters of those jets. And the third part where I'm moving is the compact jets. As I mentioned, these jets are detected in the uh, starting or ending of an outburst. So we targeted these jets in case of uh, Max 1820. This source went into outburst in mass 2018, and it's a dynamically confirmed black hole. And MW observed this source with high cadence during so in this source, we detected a, a prolonged hard state. And you can see in these images, one of the image, the left-hand side image is for uh, MW, and the right-hand side image is for LOFAR, because LOFAR also, uh, also observed this source. And you can see that compact jets are observed in both, with, both the, uh, with both the instruments. And these are the first time detection of a compact jet at frequency uh, say less than 500 megahertz. So this is a big thing uh, in understanding these jets. Uh, can we go to the next one? So when we look at the light per broadband light curve, you can see that. So the first one, uh, the trying the, the diamond one is from AB, and then blue you can see our uh, MWA of detections. So in the other three bottom three panels, I have shown the swift bat maxi and the hardness ratio just to show where we are detecting our hard state and when we are detecting uh, the transition of the states. So 
In pink, I have shown the low power observations. You can see, can you see my cursor where I'm uh, moving it? You can see there where there's a tr uh, transition of the states and there is uh, the detection of transient jet that was confirmed by Meerkat also, because Meerkat, uh, there was a paper in uh, Nature Astronomy by Bright et al. So they talk about this particular uh, Meerkat detection in the paper. But, uh, LOFAR also detected this source, and you can see that we detected the variability uh, at 143 megahertz also. But if, as I mentioned when I was talking about uh, the Wonderland model, according to them, the variability must have been smooth enough. We should not detect this kind of variability. So this this this, this suggested that uh, there are limitations in Wonderland model, and this is the, this is something I will say is the observational evidence for that. Now, I highlighted one particular point with the dashed line. So during this particular uh, this particular instance, uh, we targeted this source in multiple all the way from infrared to MW frequencies. And we study uh, the spectrum for this compact jet. Now, there are various theoretical models which suggested that there is a turnover in low frequencies. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Oh, yeah, so in right hand side, you can see that this is a uh, model given by Malzac. According to them, there are collisions between uh, the plasma blobs as uh, a compact jet is progressing. And in the low frequency at around 1 kb, you can have a signature of a turnover. And this turnover suggested when these compact jets are dumping their energy into the environment. Now, if you look at the left hand side plot, you can see. There is a turnover here that corresponds to uh, this particular turnover, which is nothing but the jet base, which is the point where uh, these uh, compact jets got uh, the first acceleration event. And then you can see it can be well fitted with the power law up to the MW frequencies. We have not detected the slow frequency turnover at one gigahertz up to the MW frequencies. So uh, this suggested that what the theory is predicting that they are dumping their energy at that uh, the, the physical distance that these theories predicted uh, that physical distance is much larger than that it means they are dumping their energy at a much farther distance from the compact object and th this is a big thing as far as uh, the theoretical point of view of these uh, jets are concerned now the next thing that i will talk about the Oh, yeah, please go to the next slide. Uh, is further uh, constraints that we have observed on the Wendell model. So this is uh, multi frequency light curve for Maxi 1348 minus 60. It was uh, uh, monitored with a meerkat also in high credits. You can see, and so here every line that is the big dashed line and then small vertical line highlight one day observations so you can see that you can see my uh, cursor so around this particular moment oh okay sure, sure. at this moment you can see that there's a big jump in the radio flux density at mw frequencies now this suggested that a compact jet quenched and then we have uh, our transient jet but at the peak you can see that there is a big uh, variation in the in the radio flux density at mw frequencies also. here you can see it is something around 400 500 religion skis then it dropped down to something like 300 then it is again jumped to around 400 religion skis and then it is again a uh, drop down to like uh, 200 or something like 300 religion skis so this this variation that we are observing of the order of say 200 or 300 religion skis that cannot be justified with a uh, vendor so it means we need uh, some more insight into that model to explain these uh, swift variations in the flux systems. Uh, so further, we are working on uh, these systems and we are further targeting uh, because this study is more like benchmarking that yes, we can uh, target these uh, radio jets with as capital cells, we can detect them at low frequencies. And now further we are targeting, first of all, we look more into the compact jet just to have an idea whether 
uh, it means the non detection of the turnover is it just limited to this particular source or it is universal it means we try to have a bigger statics to give some more uh, idea about the non detection of uh, that compact jet turnover and then further we are uh, try to uh, we are looking forward for detecting uh, or studying these transient jets and detection of that uh, turnover which is due to the synchrotron cell position and then we are further looking that what how this turnover uh, varies with the state the flux as the source progresses can you please go to the next slide yeah so with the summary i will say thank you very much for listening to me and now we will take up your um, questions thanks jay um time for talk uh, questions Okay, so I see already Sunil has raised his hand. I'll, I'll just go with Sunil. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Jay, for uh, giving us a, a nice overview of whatever you were doing at, I mean, uh, at Curtin and then now uh, in Montana. So, and, and I mean, my question is on the, uh, can you go to the light curve you showed in previous slides? Light curve of Jay. Uh, max cj zero one two uh, one eight, yeah zero one two uh, yeah light curve yes this one yes so here you uh, clearly there is a jump in uh, flux uh, by mwa and meerkat also so meerkat kind of flux confirms that there. is it like a, a long term variation uh, having a faster variation superimposed onto it on and I can see that the jump kind of uh, feature uh, within a uh, couple of days and what it tells us about the jet in this source. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you a little bit. I think... Um... We got this. Okay. So we'll just wait for a few seconds. Okay. 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 Yeah, you're muted. Some internet issue at my side. Yeah, so you're talking about this particular. Uh, so, Sunil, you are, are you talking about this particular plot or some other plot? Yes, yes, yes. I'm so, I was yeah. asking about this particular plot and specifically and the jump. Uh, jump which you see uh, in the flux by MWA at 216 megahertz and you see that within within one or two days their flux has gone up by uh, say a couple of times so uh, is it is it like a normal scenario in in these compact jets or it's a how you see in terms of like a, a particle acceleration point of view Then compact jet switched off, and what uh, we detect is the transient jet. So what we what we are detecting at the peak is nothing but the transient jet. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So so you can have in case of transient jets, the explanation that we can give is more like there is a possibility of a second ejection event, or the second possibility is that as the plasma blob is moving into the space. It is colliding with the environment and then it is getting bright enough again and then it is not uh, it is passing through uh, uh, environment where there is not that is not that much dense but then it again collide with some kind of a cloud or something then it again bright enough so th that is the second second explanation for this, this variability okay so do you see any spectral variation during these phases yep 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 so uh, i have not talked about it but uh, here, where there is a meerkat uh, detection, uh, detection also, 
So we detect a turnover here at this point. Plus we detect turnover later on also. So we observe a variation in the turnover. And that is something which is very interesting. Uh, I have not talked about those turnovers here, but yes, we detect a variability in the turnover. Uh, so okay. variability in the spectrum means that turnover is moving. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, anyone else? Um, I don't see any raised hands being raised at this point. So I would say thanks, Jay. Um, thanks for giving the talk. Um, and yeah, of course, um, if you have your email, so if anyone have your questions. Yeah, please, 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 if, you, if, you, if there is any questions, so if you need any. Yeah. Emails. So yeah, let's everyone thank uh, Jay for giving us a great colloquium. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Okay. So bye bye, Jay. Bye. Bye, everyone.